I gather this is, uh, will be one of those lectures that you won't have to know for the final exam, uh, but uh, I hope you find it interesting. Uh, uh, the best way I have of introducing myself is to mention to you that uh, I did notice that downstairs there is a Mises uh, Institute book for sale called Economic Controversies, and it consists of more than 50 essays by the late, great Murray Rothbard. It includes an introduction, and the first sentence of that introduction reads, it was nearly 40 years ago that Murray Rothbard changed my life. Now, that introduction is written by me. Uh, I was, in fact, asked by a rep of the, of the Mises Institute uh, about 10 years ago if I would contribute an introduction to that book. And of course, I was greatly honored to do so. Uh, you can imagine if he changed my life nearly 40 years ago. That's, of course, by now nearly 50 years ago. Uh, the only thing I can clarify is that while I did meet Murray Rothbard briefly a couple of times, he changed my life through his books. And the nearly 40 years ago occurrence was that I picked up a copy of Man, Economy, and State. And that was my first exposure to Austrian economics, my first exposure to uh, the writings of Murray Rothbard. And then, uh, because that was the early 70s, there was no Mises Institute for me to attend. Uh, nothing like the wonderful series of lectures and courses you're taking now, but luckily there was a bricks and mortar bookshop in downtown Manhattan called the Laissez-Faire Bookshop. I visited it virtually every weekend and browsed and bought a couple of copies of, of uh, books there and read through Rothbard, Mises, Hayek, Hazlitt, the whole slew of people. So I became typically sort of one of those self-taught in Austrian economics. Uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for that, and that hopefully will uh, allow you to appreciate the fact that my roots are in this place, in, at the Mises Institute. Uh, the last I was here was about 10 years ago delivering a talk, and uh, I, I do have to say that the place is even better than it was before. I don't know whether to give that uh, credit to Jeff Dice. More than likely, what's really happened is that a whole generation of people have grown up uh, with uh, Austrian economics, and that's why you had such a, uh, you've been having such a rich assortment of lectures from so many brilliant people. Uh, I've been sitting here all day enjoying them, unfortunately. I've got to go back to New York City tomorrow, but I'd love to be, uh, would love to have stayed another couple of days and listened to all these wonderful talks. Well, I'm going to build on them, I hope, a little bit uh, and say further only that uh, I had a kind of an odd career. I left the academy and uh, went to Wall Street, but then I spent uh, more than a quarter of a century covering uh, the, uh, the data for Barron's Financial Weekly, doing a column. And, and uh, in fact, uh, I was book review editor, and I was privileged to invite a few Mises people to write book reviews for Barron's. Uh, and, uh, but I, I covered the data. That was my job. And I, I wrote a book called Econo Spinning. It was published in 2006, How to Read Between the Lines When the Media Manipulate the Numbers. That's still in print. Another book that I think is really good on the data is, is Bob Murphy's book, Contra Krugman. Bob is, a, Bob is one of those Austrian economists who I think certainly knows the data, much of the data, at least as well as I do. And uh, I want to recommend to people, to you, that uh, you may want to take a deep dive, read those two books, take a deep dive into government data. As much, and indeed, of course, statistics, the root of that word is the state. And, uh, and indeed, you're, so you're really looking at the sinfulness of government data. It's an interesting question to ask, what would, the, would there be data, would there be a market for data if there were only a free market? And, and if the government weren't involved at all in the economy, which is the way things should be, aside from if there is a government, aside from just enforcing contracts and enforcing other violations of the zero aggression principle. But if there were uh, no, only a free market, would there be data? Would there be a market for data? I think there would. I think the data would be better than it is today. I even think there might be price indexes. 
the, the only story I guess I could tell on Murray Rothbard, much, much as I think he was, of course, the man who changed my life, is that he was a little hypocritical about price indexes. In his, in his, mark, in his, in his book, Man, Economy, and State, he talks about the impossibility of price indexes. And in a sense, he's right. The difficulty, it's more of an art than a science. And yet, I did notice, and I think it's in his writings as well, I did notice that when he was lecturing on economic history, he had no compunction about using price indexes when they became useful. And so that's, in a way, uh, how you might approach economic data. Some of it is useful. And I want, but I want, I want to walk you through a story that I call the dirty data of labor compensation myths. I'm emphasizing that story because one of my big concerns as a free market person who came from a left-wing background, shockingly enough, when I was the age of most of you, I was a democratic socialist, having risen from the depravity of being a, a card-carrying, not a card-carrying communist. My mommy was a commie. She was the card-carrying communist. But, but, but I, was a, I was a pretty enthusiastic Stalinist at the age of seven. I, out, I, I outgrew it at the age of 10 or 11, but I outgrew it only by becoming a sort of a democratic socialist. And uh, I'm, uh, that, that's my brief story, but, but why is it helpful? Well, it's helpful because one of my obsessions is to lecture the left on how capitalism really is on the side of the little guy. That, that, it, that my brief answer to many people who ask me, why are you pro-free market? Why are you a libertarian? I, I like to say, because I care about the well-being of the broad masses of people. That's why I'm a libertarian. Because it, when we talk about a lot of sort of rarefied things, all of many of which are very important, there is this sort of gut level reaction on the part of the left that, oh, well, you're talking about you know, economics for smart people. You're, you're talking about the, the economics for the few and not for the many. You, know, you, you, uh, you know, innovative, smart people have a lot of fun under capitalism. But how about the ordinary person? How does that person cope? under capitalism. Well, uh, I believe that, I believe that primarily, if you, if you could tote up uh, the, the benefits and, 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 uh, and other aspects of free market capitalism, you could sort of subjectively declare that its main attribute is that it brings equality. It, it, it lifts the living standards of the broad masses of people. That's really its principal magic. And, uh, and that, I think, is a message that, that we should tell uh, to them in all kinds of possible ways that we, that we can. And, but my concern, as somebody who knows the numbers, has been that there's been a resurgence of this idea that labor is getting shafted. Uh, now, I happen to believe that labor is getting shafted by government. Uh, th those, a couple of those ways have been mentioned already by, my previous, by the previous speakers, but two that I would mention very briefly is, is the rise of restrictive licensure. I'm all for certifying lawyers. Uh, but, but I don't believe in restrictive licensure. I believe that most of us could practice real estate and divorce law. If we worked for a, a law firm for a few months, we'd learn the ropes. We don't have to go to college and law school to do it. But, but even more perniciously, uh, the, uh, the, about 5% of jobs were under a restrictive licensure of one sort or another about 50 years ago. And now it's up to about 25%. Now, I believe that, that what that does is it really does inhibit the mobility of labor. Uh, because what we're talking about, of course, the focus is usually on being a manicurist, being an assistant to a funeral director. The kind of jobs that ordinary people can get, much more difficult to get, much more costly to acquire because you have to meet all kinds of state requirements. The other one, more subtly, which the progressives miss, is, is the weird fact that so much migration goes to areas of the country where housing is cheap. That's not where the high paying jobs are, but that's where the housing is cheap. And where the housing is cheap is where government is usually less involved uh, in, in the housing market. But in the high wage areas, San Francisco, New York City, Los Angeles, in the high wage areas, housing is prohibitively expensive. And this especially shafts people of limited means, ordinary workers. And I do think that you do that you find from the official numbers some gap in equality, a, a widening inequality of wages between the higher paid and the lower paid. And I think that those two factors have a lot to do with it, both of them having to do with government intervention 
in the marketplace. So that's the best way those progressives can help equality. But by and large, by and large, there, are, there, there hasn't been that much change in the way that labor is paid in the aggregate. And I want to walk you through a few myths uh, about it and try to expose them and explain how they work. Well, I'm calling it the dirty data of, of a labor compensation myth. I'll start with uh, a quote from uh, what? From uh, the press secretary for Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. That's Brianna Gray. Joy Gray, she said to him, the share that goes to laborers has gotten less and less and less. Um, what else does she say? While corporate profits have soared, the share of national income that goes to labor has declined, and it's near its lowest point in almost 70 years. That's a government working paper. And then uh, uh, this is uh, even the Cato Institute, um, a libertarian think tank mentions significant declines in the labor share of income, uh, and, uh, and he thinks that the remedy should be worker representation on corporate boards. The Cato Institute is, of course, a libertarian think tank, and uh, the, uh, the ghost of Karl Marx is what David Henderson refers to. David Henderson is a very good free market economist, and yet he's written an essay called The Decline in Labor Share of Income, and then in a course he taught, he told the students that although I'm no Marxist, I did find this a little concerning. Well, uh, I'm going to mention uh, some really uh, established academicians who've written peer-reviewed papers who push the same story. Labor is getting shafted. I'm going to explain what they say and why it is a violation of Econ 101. Uh, but I want to start with something that we see on Twitter a lot. Uh, and uh, I'll walk you through the chart. Uh, you see it on Twitter, you see it from the Economic Policy Institute, uh, left-wing institutes, and it really has not been challenged. This is the official story. The red line tracks, tracks the real output per hour of all persons. Uh, that's inflation adjusted. And this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, directly from them. Uh, and the uh, blue line tracks real compensation per hour. That, too, is inflation adjusted. Uh, the outrageous fact is that from uh, late 1940s to the early 1970s, the two tracked each other. But then uh, real compensation per hour greatly lagged uh, real output per hour of all persons. You can see the red line rising, the blue line lagging. And I will tell you, the funny thing is that I've seen a number of free market people who connect this with, uh, with, with Nixon's uh, lifting of the gold window, uh, closing the gold window, I should say. Uh, that in, in the early 70s, uh, uh, the, up until the early 70s, the Bretton Woods Agreement uh, 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 obligated the US government to, uh, to redeem in gold any foreigners holding dollars, and then Nixon abrogated that. Now, that might have caused a lot of problems. But what's interesting is that I've seen libertarians swear by this chart and declare that that's all because Nixon uh, closed the gold window. Uh, so nobody doubts that it must be true. After all, it's inf both, both those series are inflation adjusted. And uh, they both come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And uh, look at what happened. Suddenly, labor was not being paid its output per hour in real terms. Well, um, now let me tell the unofficial story. Uh, the red line uh, tracks output per hour of all persons in nominal dollars. And uh, the, uh, the, is that the red line? Yeah, the red line, yeah. And the blue line tracks, uh, uh, yeah, tracks uh, compensation per hour in nominal dollars. Now, that's also from your Bureau of Labor Statistics. What have I done? Very little. All I did was take out the inflation adjustment from both of those series. All I did was, was restore them to nominal dollars. No longer inflation adjusted, just how do they fare in nominal dollars? Now, uh, maybe you don't have to be an Austrian to recognize that business sells its goods and values its goods in nominal dollars. Business pays its wages in nominal dollars. And, and indeed, as any sort of you know, uh, macroeconomist worth his salt would say, a nominal versus a nominal equals a real. Nominal divided by a nominal equals a real. You're, you're lining up nominal dollars year by year by year. 
and uh, they're, uh, they, they, they are, uh, in real terms, uh, uh, reflect each other. And again, to repeat, wages are paid in nominal dollars, output is sold in nominal dollars, and suddenly, those two lines are tracking each other. If you, if you, if you calculate them in terms of percentage rises, you'll, you'll find that since the 1970s, the percentage rise of labor compensation in nominal dollars has tracked the, the percentage rise of labor output in nominal dollars. So that's all I did. And when I ran this chart a couple of times on Twitter, it, it looked like I, had, I was some kind of liar or magician. They were, they were left-wingers who decided to, uh, to, uh, to block me from now on. I, how could I possibly do such an outrageous thing as to take away their candy, what they seemingly believe? Well, uh, now, what is the story behind this? Why do you get the two tracking each other if you simply take out the inflation adjustment from both series? What you, what you find is that these numbers have been kept, so to speak, according to two sets of books. The, the, the labor compensation number has been deflated by this consumer price index uh, that the BLS also publishes, Bureau of Labor Statistics. The non-farm business sector output has been de deflated by something called the implicit price deflator. And you find that you find that up until the early 1970s, those two price indexes were approximately tracking each other. But then you find that the CPI took off and the implicit price deflator remained uh, relatively sluggish. And as you may know, in order to inflation adjust a number, you divide that number, compensation, by the, the CPI. You divide uh, output by the implicit price deflator. And so it's all in the fact that which might be a story in itself if you believe these price indexes, that something happened to the, to the prices that, 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 that were charged for consumer goods and something else happened to the value uh, in, in real terms of the output of industry. All of that is interesting, potentially. But if you're going to make a point about labor being shafted, about how labor is not being paid according to its productivity, isn't it much simpler to line up the nominal dollars with the nominal dollars and then see what you get? Again, because goods are sold in nominal dollars and, uh, and, 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 uh, and people are paid in nominal dollars. So again, this, this is something if you, if, if, I, I will guarantee you that if you troll through left-wing, uh, left-oriented tweets, you're gonna find this chart, a chart like this repeated over and over again. It's rock-ribbed fact, labor is getting shafted, it's not being paid, it's productivity. All because of a simple error of measurement that I would submit is pretty palpable uh, and on the part. Uh, by the way, the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't really, the nominal number, I had to, I had to tease it out. I, it's, it's easy enough to get, but it's not really, it's not really readily accessible, the, 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 the current dollar numbers. But, but the inflation-adjusted uh, numbers are easily accessible. Now, I should even say, by the way, that one of my confirming sources is a guy who, who was a very high up at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. They put out the national income accounts. One of my advantages as a columnist, of course, is I got to know these people who covered the government numbers. And this guy, he's now a consultant in different respects. And he said, look, it really is a bit of a joke. They, 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 think, they think that starting in the early 1970s, labor was not get, getting its, its out, its, its, uh, the value of its productivity. And it lagged and lagged and lagged. And, so wh why don't they ask themselves, well, where did all that income go? Profits must have gone through the roof. The profits must have tripled and quadrupled, is what the guy honestly says to me. And of course, you don't find that at all in the aggregate. I won't show you those numbers, but you, you might be curious to know, my God, the, the exploitation rate has been off the charts, and how could that possibly have happened? Well, it didn't happen. It didn't happen if you look at the nominal numbers. Uh, well. Now I want to get into something a little bit more subtle uh, that, uh, that, that really arises from the quote that I, uh, that I began with. Uh, and uh, it, it begins with the idea of a ratio of labor share. Uh, and uh, I, I, I believe it's potentially a legitimate uh, calculation, labor share, as long as you accept the broad aggregate numbers of the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which keeps the GDP numbers and keeps the broad macro numbers. Labor share, 
is uh, calculated uh, by, uh, by first with a numerator being a measure of labor compensation, including benefits. Now, I, I saw Paul Krugman uh, cite labor uh, compensation excluding benefits. But benefits are, uh, be benefits are pension contributions, benefits are, me are medical uh, uh, care insurance. And obviously, if you have a job and, and they're contributing to your 401k or if they have you in a, uh, in a regular pension plan, or if, if they also are paying for your medical insurance, that's something that, you that would be out of pocket. And most people, certainly including Krugman, and certainly, including there's another editorial writer at the New York Times who, who, who takes out compensation. You'd have to ask them, don't you find benefits are valuable to you? you know, because if you didn't get these benefits as calculated, then, then, uh, then obviously you'd have to spend money uh, out of your wages and salaries on them. So, but but uh, most of these calculations, except when Krugman runs them, uh, are a measure of labor compensation, including benefits. But then there's the denominator. Uh, the denominator is uh, the measure of in a measure of income and output, and that's where the problem arises. Uh, but uh, now let me get to uh, a quote from. There's something odd that the, the there is a dissent from one mainstream economist. I began with quotes from different sources, and I'm going to get to some others saying that labor is not labor's share is in the, is in the it, it has been has been declining for the last 20, 30 years. That labor so that somehow or other labor used to get a certain share of income, and now it's getting far less. But the interesting thing is that. The, the, the only dissenting source that I've come across is a assistant chief economist at the Bureau of, Eco of Economic Analysis, which generates the numbers. He's written a paper in which he has concluded that labor share does remain within its historical range. Uh, I've written him, I've corresponded with him, but what's very clear is that he, while he doesn't mind publishing this paper, he also doesn't mind that it doesn't get a lot of uh, attention because he doesn't want to do battle with so many, uh, I would think, uh, that's my, my best guess, is that he doesn't really want to contradict so many established sources that look at this decline in labor share and start creating all kinds of crazy ideas about it with respect to, for example, monopsony, which, the, which was mentioned uh, in the er earlier talk, that, that there's this huge monopsonistic uh, cartel that, uh, on the part of the capitalists, and that's why labor share is in the pits. They're building all kinds of th uh, theories about it based upon, as I'm about to explain to you, based upon bogus numbers that, that, that make the same kind of simple, fallacious uh, uh, mistake that the previous uh, uh, set of numbers also made. Uh, now, um, what do we mean by historical range? He said historical range. And that, that uh, the, the past 75 years since World War II, which is a reasonable cutoff point for reasonable reasons, with, with quarterly data starting in 1947. That's the historical range. And there's something interesting about that, uh, which I'll get to in a moment. But it, we're looking at the last 75 years. Uh, and uh, that starts in the late 1940s. Well, uh, what do I have here? Uh, well. Uh, I'm going to start then with the Wall Street Journal, since that's not a new daily newspaper that's known for its hostility toward capitalism. But it did run a major article by this journalist named Peter Kiernan. Uh, uh, and uh, he wrote uh, in, a, in a, a piece called, Despite la Tight Labor Market, Labor Forces Income is Squeezed, Workers' Slice of the Pie has been shrinking, confounding economists. Their slice of the pie has been shrinking. And this is the chart that he ran, uh, although I've simplified it a bit. Uh, this chart is labor compensation. That's, again, wages. All of labor actually includes government labor. All of labor, including wages and salaries and, as well, uh, benefits. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, I've done it as a 40-quarter moving average in order to smooth out the bumps. Uh, and that's a percentage of gross domestic income. Gross domestic income, remember that. Uh, and what it shows, and consistent with what he has said, is that labor share was, uh, it's four to quarter, four quarter, 40 quarter or 10 year moving average, was you know, at 53%, and then now it's down to uh, you know, only uh, 50, uh, what, 52%. It's, it, it, it was rising here, and then it 
fell, and now I've drawn a red line at 53.02 and showing that it's at pretty much at a 75-year low. And that's, that's what he has run, and that's what you find in his Wall Street Journal article. But now, again, notice that, I've, that the denominator is gross domestic income. Now, we're going to do a little Econ 101. Now, notice something else. This is the same data, except the denominator is net domestic income. Uh, labor compensation is a percentage of net domestic income. And uh, it now looks noticeably different. Uh, and I'll, of course, explain the difference between gross and net domestic income in a moment. But examine it and now recognize one thing, that, co that labor compensation is now 63 0.16% of net domestic income, and it's a higher number than any number through uh, 1970. It's, a, it's, it's equal to a higher than any number through 1970. And uh, what we're going to find by looking at other examples is something really rather odd and, and somewhat embarrassing to progressives. If you think this is a valid measure, and it is approximately correct, then what is it telling us? It's actually telling us that over the last 10 to 20 years, as conventionally measured, labor compensation as a percentage of net domestic income is about where it was in the 1950s and 1960s, actually a little bit higher. It tells us further that labor compensation into the 70s and 80s, 90s, rose and then fell back to the levels of the 50s and 60s. Now, why is this extremely embarrassing to progressives? Because they are constantly telling us that the 1950s and 60s are the decades we've got to return to. That's when, that's when unions in the private sector represented uh, about one third of the labor force, and now it's down to 6%. That's when the bogeyman of, of uh, competition from abroad, cheap labor from abroad, uh, was practically non-existent. Uh, uh, that uh, was when uh, they were no longer, and now, of course, they claim that it's the, the, the rise of the high-tech firms. That's another reason uh, for it. The high-tech firms didn't exist. Uh, the, all of the factors that they mentioned that are at fault uh, were, were not a problem or were working well in the 50s and 60s. And yet, the stark fact is that if you take labor share measures seriously, you find that for some strange reason, when the bad stuff happened in the 80s, Ronald Reagan takes over and breaks the power of the, of, of, of the unions, and union and labor unionization goes into a tailspin. Uh, and that's when labor compensation is higher. That's when it's rising. Uh, global competition begins in the 80s and, and into the 90s, and, 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 that's, and that's when labor compensation is at its highest. Uh, the, the, the world turns upside down if you track labor compensation according to this measure. Now, I will now want to explain to you why this measure is the valid one. Uh, now, um, what is the difference between gross domestic income and net domestic income? Well, net domestic income, by the way, is the income side of gross domestic product. It is gross domestic product, except measured on the income side rather than the product side. Uh, and net domestic income is simply uh, the difference, it's simply uh, minus depreciation. We were given a lecture on capital, uh, on, on, on capital theory earlier today, and depreciation was mentioned. And now, let me get to the Bureau of Economic Analysis definition of depreciation, because I think it will make sense in, for Austrians. Uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, in their handbook, says that the consumption of fixed capital or depreciation is the charge for the using up of private and government fixed capital located in the United States. It is the decline in the value of the stock of fixed assets due to wear and tear, obsolescence, accidental, accidental damage, and aging. Now. Uh, Let's get to another interesting concept called national income. The Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, defines national income as the sum of all incomes net of the consumption of fixed capital earned in production. Earned in production. Now, what are we really saying? What we're really saying is that 
any measure of income, if you are going to do macro measures, I know that Austrians book this, but if you're going to do any kind of measure for any sector, why do you want to, uh, to subtract the allowance for depreciation? Because if you don't make an allowance for depreciation, as we were told earlier today, the economy will ultimately sink into oblivion. You have to make an allowance to shore up the depreciation of capital. The income that's left after that allowance is the only income that's really available. And, and interestingly enough, the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis and Conventional Measures make an allowance for this by making a distinction between gross and net. Gross domestic product and net domestic product, gross domestic product and net domestic income. Now, again, what I showed you was that if you take net domestic income in your denominator, you're going to get a very different result for labor share. And let me go over that a little bit more. Gross domestic product equals gross domestic income. Net domestic product equals net domestic income. And they are the same measures, uh, although they're measured in different conceptually, they're the same. And then uh, what does the Bureau of Economic Analysis say about net domestic product? It may be viewed as an estimate of sustainable product, which is a rough measure of the level of consumption that can be maintained while leaving capital assets intact. It's the, it's the you leaving capital assets intact because you are making an allowance for the depreciation of capital that you're shoring up. And now, what is the other, why do I get a difference when I put net domestic income into the, into the denominator versus gross domestic income? Something else that's gone on in the US economy, which I think is valid, depreciation has been taking an increasing bite out of gross domestic income. So that, again, the net result is that here's net domestic income has declined as a share of gross domestic income. Now, why is that? Uh, yeah, that's because uh, there's been increase in investment in equipment and software as a percentage of private sector capital investment. This is in nominal dollars. And uh, we are looking, we, in, in the 50s and 60s, there was an emphasis on the building of structures, and they depreciate very slowly. Over the last 30 years, there's been a, a, a huge tilt toward investment in equipment and software. Those are also capital goods, I would maintain, and they depreciate very quickly. And so that is... The reason why, if you are going to use an historical measure of labor share, you have to use a net figure rather than a gross figure. Because, because, the, because the net figure is the true measure of the income and product available, and the net figure has declined. So that if you do the math, if the, if the, net, if the, net, if the net is lower and lower, then, then the percentage becomes very different if the denominator, if the numerator rather, is the same. Hopefully, you grasp that math. Well, what else do I have here to present to you? Yeah, uh, well, again, this is the same guy. Actually, his name is Benjamin Bridgman. He says, recent net labor share is within its historical range, whereas gross share is at its low lowest level. I removed depreciation since paying for it only returns the economy to the production possibilities of the previous period. Using net production thus only includes output, which can be used for current consumption or expanding future production. But... The experts still stick to GDP. Now, here, here is a quote from a peer-reviewed paper from, from a group of five economists with huge prestige, and they write, the fall of labor's share of GDP in the United States and many other countries in recent decades is well, well documented, but its causes remain uncertain. They then go on to say that it's all because of the rise of superstar firms. Uh, they, they are quoting, they're using gross domestic product as their measure. They are right, it's well documented. But what, they, what these superstar economists have apparently missed is that gross domestic product is no longer a, a continuous measure for labor share to, to, to be put into the denominator. And again, that's because of the, the new nature of investment and the fact that depreciation is being kept, taking an increasing bite out of it. I could send them this chart, and their whole thesis about superstar firms would fall apart. This is labor compensation as a share of net domestic product. Again, it tells the same story. Take net domestic product rather than gross domestic product, and you're going to get the same result, which is that we are about where we were in the 50s and 60s. So if you're talking about the rise of superstar firms, how 
overcomes it, that we're doing about as well as, as we did in the 50s and 60s when there were no, none of these superstar firms, which of course are Amazon and Google and all these other firms that they clearly think is a problem. They don't, their story falls apart once you use a simple measure. Now, uh, let me see how much time I have. I'll, I'll cover one other subtle part of this. Uh, yeah, this is, this is a, a, a narrower measure, uh, and this is for non-financial corporations. Um, and uh, non, the, uh, the, the measure of non-financial corporations is actually the best measure to use for corporations. And it, it's a measure that is run by the Bureau of Labor Statistics as well as the BEA. The Bureau of Labor Statistics will run a measure that looks like this. Labor compensation is a percentage of gross value added. Why do I take non-financial corporations? Because financial corporations used to be about 5% of the corporate sector, and they're now about 13 to 14%. As an Austrian, I happen to think that, that while there's some, been some good things reflected in the fact that financial corporations are more important than ever, there's lots of reasons to find that to be a problem. Uh, the, uh, for example, there would be no need for uh, foreign currency trading uh, by financial corporations. It's a big source of revenue if, if there was simply just one currency in the world rather than all the balkanized currencies. There are lots of reasons to think that these financial corporations are, are a little bit of a distortion, but they, they make a higher rate of profit, and, uh, and we, could, we could have a separate listing for them, but, but they, what they do is that they distort the number. It's fairly well recognized, but the non-financial corporations that are still about 87% of the corporate sector are still pretty much a good core measure. And, but, and indeed, the Bureau of Labor Statistics runs data for them in terms of productivity. They, they themselves think that it's a good core measure, and they run a labor compensation number. And the difficulty that I have is that anybody who wants to contradict me about what's actually happened to labor compensation can cite directly Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers because the Bureau of Labor Statistics does not publish any numbers netting out depreciation. Uh, and they only publish gross numbers. And so how can I possibly argue with an august organization like them? So what they run is, for example, labor compensation as a percentage of gross value added. That's, that's similar to the gross domestic product of, of, the non, of these non-financial corporations, gross value added of the non-financial corporations. And they do indeed show a precipitous decline in labor share. But then if you, if you take labor compensation as a percentage of net value added, and the only way to get that number, by the way, is to go to the BEA's website, where they have depreciation figures for the net uh, non-financial corporations. And there you find this pretty much the same story. Uh, we, the, uh, the compensation is now, again, comparable to what it was in the 50s and 60s. And then uh, you also find, as a matter of fact, Benjamin Bridgman of the BEA does another figure which is kind of interesting. Labor compensation for non-financial corporations as a percentage of net value added minus production taxes. Bridgman points out there, is a, there are actually taxes that corporations pay that by virtue of producing. This is not corporate income taxes. This is just the taxes that are imposed on the first dollar of production. So if you, so if you subtract those out, then you get another figure for the actual amount of income that could be distributed between labor and uh, between profits and labor compensation. And you find an actually firmer result, which is, again, that over the last 10 to 20 years, we've been where we were in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and uh, let's see what else I have. Uh, minus production taxes. OK, what else do we find? All right. Now, uh, uh, I've anticipated this point, but I think it's worth going over it, rounding up the usual suspects. Uh, this is uh, in the New York Times. Economists have offered various explanations for why workers are not doing better, the steady weakening of labor, uh, of labor unions, the ability of American companies to find cheaper labor abroad or animate further, or automate further, piddling productivity growth, and the rise of superstar companies that are extremely efficient with a relatively small labor force. Well. Uh, do I have, I think I have another quote, uh, yeah, Wall Street Journal. Uh, economists cite a number of possible explanations for the change. One is the workers' ability to negotiate wage increases is weakened, union representation has fallen, China's entry, and all the rest of it. Now again, all of these explanations become absurd once you actually look at a proper measurement of the trend in labor share. They become absurd because 
if, because if you ask, well, what was happening to labor share when none of these were, were operating, or when they were operating in reverse, when unions were strong, you find that labor share is doing about as well, if not somewhat better, than it did in the 1950s and 60s. And what else do I have? Yeah, uh, yeah this is for nine, I guess this is my final chart, uh, the glory days of corporate profits. Uh, uh, this is another, this is the flip side of that anomaly. Uh, this is again, is for non-financial corporations because they're a decent uh, 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 series, a, a, a relatively constant series. Uh, this is uh, uh, pre-tax profits as a percentage of the actual uh, net value and uh, the real income of non-financial corporations. Well, notice that the profits were highest in the 50s and 60s, that the profits fell in the 70s and 80s and were now uh, risen a bit, but we're now uh, 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 lower than, we're still lower than we were in the 50s and 60s. That's actually the story of corporate profits, uh, because again, you might want to look on the flip side of all this. We began by talking about how labor is shafted because of they're not getting their productivity. We, we talked about how labor is shafted because they're not getting their share. And we should be finding that the corporate profits have gone through the roof as a share of the income of, of these non-financial corporations. And we don't find that to be the case at all. I'll tell you something else interesting about this chart. Uh, we find that, that corporate profits tended to be low in the high inflation 1970s and early 80s. Corporate profits as a share of income tended to be low, and they were highest in the low inflation 1950s and 60s. But that's another story altogether. Uh, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm finishing early, and if any of you want to ask some questions or make some comments, I'd be grateful. Uh, hopefully, I've walked you through a few of the numbers. What I've tried to show you is that if you have your head screwed on right, you read the Austrians, you try to make sense of the numbers, you talk to people in, in, uh, who, who actually run the numbers, you can find uh, some of the most appalling mistakes uh, that the mainstream will make. And the whole, there, there were actually, there's another more complicated uh, uh, mistake that's being made with respect to labor share. What, I, what, what, what you do find is that while there's one lone, lone voice at the Bureau of Economic Analysis that is called, that has blown the whistle on all this, uh, they, it's diff difficult to contradict the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But this is really just an exercise in economic 101 measurement, which shows that a whole lot of presumably sophisticated economists cannot get it right, and that the, the zeal with which they pounce the, 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 the attitude they take, which is that, I guess, that, that what, that, that, that government must do something because labor is being shafted, uh, the mistakes that they can make in the process really do uh, uh, somewhat shock you, I trust, because these are fairly elementary mistakes. Any questions? So do you have any like reading recommendations that can like direct us uh, or like resources on how to interpret uh, certain types of data and like aggregate measures? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, as a matter of fact, I, I mean, the only, uh, I, as I mentioned to you, the only good titles that I can recommend, I'm going to try to think of some others, uh, but uh, the good titles I can recommend are um, uh, my book, <laughs> Counter Spinning, which is still in print. And, uh, and Bob Murphy's, uh, because Bob Murphy really does a dive into the data because uh, Krugman covered the data and, uh, and, and Murphy covers them very well also. Uh, and uh, I mean, the odd part of it is that, uh, if you, as I say, in this particular case, I've been quoting from the, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis handbook. Uh, and uh, I, you know, the, the, I should say, the Bureau of Economic Analysis is uh, the agency that's part of the Commerce Department and they, they cover uh, the, the broad aggregate numbers and they have their own price measure. Then there's the Bureau of Labor Statistics that covers the unemployment rate and then does productivity and it also issues its CPI. The Bureau of Economic Analysis is a much more sophisticated agency than the Bureau of Labor Statistics and actually if you read their handbook, uh, which, uh, which you'll find online, where they explain the data, I, uh, the quotes that I gave you I think were pretty good. Pretty sensible, and uh, so I, I guess the third thing to recommend is uh, is reading the Bureau of Economic Analysis Handbook because it is uh, 
It, it, it does explain uh, the data pretty well. It's got about seven chapters. And if you go, because all the, I, I've, I, most of these data come from Haver Analytics. They've given me a free subscription to their data, and it's very user friendly. But of course, you can get, uh, you can get their data, the, the BEA data on uh, BEA Interactive. They have all their, all their, uh, their data that, that's on spreadsheets. And of course, then a lot of people use Fred. So I guess those are three titles. <laughs> anyway, anybody else? Hi, I was born in 1995, hence I'm largely ignorant of history before then, besides what I've read in books, so I'm largely ignorant. Did you ever hear ignorant. World War II? No? No. I mean, yes, but I'm largely oh. ignorant of like economics history. Oh, so, okay. you know, if you read a standard history book, you mostly just... The Great Depression, have you heard of that? Yes, yes, I've heard of the Great Depression. How Nevertheless, you... like, I'm ignorant of any charts that correspond to... Well, yeah, so that's the next thing. A lot of those this, events. You know, I was born in 1944, it's true. And uh, this data starts in 1947. I was only three years old then. But but that right. but that and I wasn't tracking it then. I was a Stalinist at the time, as you know. <laughs> but 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 uh, but of course you can now actually of course look at history through this data. But go ahead. What was it? Yes, uh, my question is: What is your interpretation for the uh, drops in uh, corporate profits from roughly 65 to 70, and then? slightly after 95 to slightly after 2000? Yes, good question. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm not the finesse of uh, uh, most of your excellent question. The, the, only, the, only, the only thing I have noticed again is that uh, the, uh, the profits were low during the high inflation years. But you're asking me about 95 and, and 2000. Why they've risen a bit, I, I really don't know enough about it. The, the only thing I can say is that what's interesting to me, uh, I post this a lot on Twitter because uh, a lot, all the left wing, Robert Reich, for example, has got a million and a half followers on Twitter, and he says profits profits are at a 75 year high, and uh, and and I'm just posting pre tax profits as a percentage of again of, of the net income of these non financial corporations. They're not, they're not at any kind of 75 year high. Profits are actually recently not even that much higher than than they were about 15, 10, 15 years ago. But uh, again, um, my uh, my lame answer to your question is only to say that what's interesting to me is that high, in, high price inflation is not good for corporate profits. The high inflation years were the 1970s and early 80s. And you can see the corporate profits fell. The, lo the low inflation seems to be better. And so I believe that, uh, that what's going to happen, that, that even this slight bump up is probably not going to last. And that, and that really what, what seems to happen, certainly happened then and could, and seems to happen, uh, uh, will happen probably in the future, is that obviously price inflation also affects costs and, 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 uh, and, and the costs start to bite. And, uh, and I think that that probably is going to happen. Uh, the preliminary data indicates seemingly the third quarter profits, this just takes you through the, uh, I'm sorry, second quarter, this takes you through the first quarter of 2022, just the first quarter, and it, and it blipped down a little bit. It's probably going to blip down even further. They have to pay for oil, they have to pay for their labor, they've got to pay for higher debt costs, so it puts them in a squeeze. It may have been higher debt, but so I'm only answering a small part of your question, and now that you, that you know this history, I invite you to answer the next part of your question and write me an email with your answer. What, <laughs> what happened in the 90s? Yeah. Well, you want to say that in the micro, with the, well, the, 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 oh, the dot com? Yeah. Oh, oh just yes. I imagine the second drop oh, yeah, that he well, knows would be the oh, dot com mean, bubble. Oh, yeah. You're talking about, yeah, the, in 01. Yeah, yeah, that period. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah. I, should, I probably should have put in some recession bars because in, you know, you're right. Yeah. Uh, during recessions, of course, profits really suffer. Yeah, the, the uh, uh, profits are much more volatile than wages. Uh, capital investment is much more volatile. And indeed, so uh, you have helped me out with that. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. When it comes to the economists like Robert Reich and Richard Wolff, do you see them as being malicious with the way they present data, or as just being ignorant? Malicious. <laughs> well, uh, no. I think. Okay. Now, come on. First of all, why are you generalizing about the two of them? Maybe one is malicious and the other is ignorant. <laughs> and, 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 the, and really. Uh, okay, Richard Wolf is both malicious and ignorant. Now, don't. Now, now what's, I mean, this is. Now, why do you mention? I, I, I debated Richard Wolf on socialism, and, and it's gotten nearly 5.2 million uh, views on YouTube and a commensurate number of, of, uh, of the podcast downloads. And I owe it all to Richard Wolf, I think. I debated two other socialists, and that got about 100,000 views. But with Richard Wolf, it takes off. I think I'm coattail riding on Richard Wolf. Uh, but, but interestingly enough, uh, a week after our debate, his, 
Give me a very long-winded answer. A week after our debate, he delivered a lecture in downtown Manhattan, and uh, and for ten minutes he talked about the debate he'd had with a libertarian. And 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 I and I, I have a video of that that I post because it was available on video. I, I post those ten minutes, and I, and I offer a, a, a free lifetime subscription to the Soul Forum debates for anybody who can verify a single thing that he recalls. And a week after the debate, uh, he, he invented a completely fictitious narrative about what I had said and what he had said. And uh, OK, that could be denial. Maybe that's not viciousness. But, but I, I, like I was told, I was told by a, by a, a guy in, in this same department, told by a progressive socialist who used to be in the department with Richard Wolf at UMass, that everybody hated him, nobody was talking to him, he's a vicious guy. And so, so that's the real, the real evidence. But Robert Reich actually, uh, she, so he's both ignorant and vicious, but Robert Reich really, uh, you know, I've seen him appear uh, and, uh, you know, I, I bridle every time somebody insi insults him for his height. You know, I, th I think it reflects well on him that he's four foot ten, and that he got, and then, and then he got this far as he did in life. I, th I think it's, I think anybody who do, who talks like that is vicious, and so I would defend this guy completely on that basis. And I've heard him speak. You know, he's a little bit smug. But he, 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 everything comes out of his butt. He, he doesn't look anything up. But, but, he, but he, he's clearly just a sort of re, like a religious fanatic. He, he, he believes that if he thinks it's right, then it must be right. And every once in a while, he's quoting an article or something like that. But most of the time, uh, he quotes nothing. He cites numbers and quotes nothing. Really, the most uh, baffling thing is that he does have 1.5 million followers and that, and that people seem to believe what he writes. So I probably should get over the habit of running a chart that contradicts what he just said. I do that a lot on, on Twitter. Uh, just to show that these are the actual numbers. But uh, so, OK, so then to sum up my long-winded response, uh, Robert Reich is, is ignorant. He's a, he's a kind of a true believer. I'm reading the book uh, The Righteous Mind uh, by um, uh, Jonathan Haidt. And, uh, and, and Jonathan Haidt makes the argument. And I don't know, Michael Malice highly recommended that book. And Jonathan Haidt basically talks about how, how, how we have the mind. We're like a person on an elephant. The, the, we've, we've got a mind, but really the elephant is telling us what to think. All of our intuitions and all, all, of, our, all of our presumptions. And then we use our mind to rationalize our prejudices, rationalize our, our assumptions and presumptions. And I want to say to Jonathan Haidt, that's true, except it's not true of libertarians. Yeah. And, 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 and the really, the reason why it's not true of libertarians is that, is that we're stuck with a relatively tragic sense of life. We're stuck with it because, because we, just, we know there's nobody on a white horse. There is no government that can cure prejudice. We know that capitalism punishes bigotry. We know that. But we're not going to deny that, that, that there still will be bigotry. That you, that, and then usually if there's a lot of bigotry, it comes primarily from the government. So there's really no solution. We, we, we have to reconcile ourselves to a lot of relatively unhappy conclusions. There are happy things that we believe in. We do see that, that a libertarian world could be a decent society, could be a good world, but it will be uh, it will be a highly imperfect world. There will still be awful things happening in society. Whereas the progressives, the progressives really think that if we just get government to behave better and act better, then uh, then most things can be solved. There won't be any bigotry because they'll pass a law against it. You know, there won't there won't be any shootings because they'll take away all the guns. All of those things. So how did I get into that? Yeah, that's because Robert Reich is really like that person in Jonathan Haidt's book, and I guess the followers are like like. Uh, that person as well. Our only hope is that maybe if you use your mind, you can you, you can uh, you, you can cope with with the world a little bit better and recognize that libertarianism and the free market is the only answer. And then, as I emphasize today, that the happy fact the happy fact is that is that capitalism not only brings freedom, it brings prosperity. You know, and then every once in a while when I get excited, I say, my God, maybe that's a good reason to believe in God. Maybe capitalism would bring liberty, li uh, freedom, and not prosperity, then what would we do? It would be kind of a dilemma. But it brings both. And now, that's, that, that, I believe, can be empirically and conceptually justified. And that's a relatively happy conclusion. And hopefully, if we preach this to, to the followers of Robert Reich, I don't expect him to learn anything at this point, but preach that to his followers. Maybe some of them will listen. And that's my long-winded answer to your question. And uh, are there any other questions? We've got about five minutes to go, Yeah, I guess.
Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>